Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Welcome to Cats and Dogs here on Press TV with me, Lembitopic, the show with the courage to run into the wolf pack of politicians and bite back from the safety of this studio. It's safe for that way. <laughs> and this week we turn our animal instincts to sniffing out the scientific shenanigans in Saudi Arabia, a country that has shown a public relations problem it can't fix with a chainsaw. <laughs> On that point, we've heard that the ever-evolving kingdom of Saudi Arabia is planning to shift up a gear to become a knowledge-based economy, to inspire rapid advances in technical and scientific innovation. But the mere suggestion of a scientifically savvy Saudi has spooked the rest of the international community. Why? Well, it's just that people don't really trust them. When Riyadh announced it was going to try its luck at the UN Human Rights Council, ironically and tragically, the death toll rose among Yemeni children. So now the kingdom is all set on a knowledge economy. The rest of the world's economies in a panic. But have they thought this through? Shifting towards this knowledge economy means the Saudis importing more skilled workers from the United States and Europe. Result, the less skilled local workforce gets fired and replaced by the more skilled imported workforce. Hey presto, high-tech international workers and more local unemployment. <laughs> Oops, Yankee Doodle Saudi, here we come. But bringing all these Americans in is going to cause a crisis, isn't it? I don't think so, because Saudis already got over 160 McDonald's, so it's all good. But joking aside, for a country that saws its political dissidents in half and then into that they are acquiring cutting-edge technology doesn't really fill you with confidence, does it? <laughs> I mean, what does cutting-edge technology mean in Saudi-speak? <laughs> Dissident-activated electric chainsaws? <laughs> the house of sound is like a fly dressed as a bee. Bees collect nectar and make honey. Flies, well, flies aren't really attracted by the whole honey thing. They're... <laughs> Actually, let's not go there. There's an example of the kind of attitude you could look at in the first ever Formula One Saudi Arabian Grand Prix. This will trigger the Lexus RCF safety car. Oh, oh that's a big shot. That is a very big crash. It doesn't... Riyadh hold a different sports event like athletics. at which he won 14 gold medals. Saudi use of sports to distract attention from chainsaw collections and cluster munitions is without borders. <laughs> King Salman has recently pledged to build a 135,000-seater stadium in Baghdad. No details have come out about this royal largesse. But let's recall that very famous old Saudi proverb that goes, I scratch your back. And you'll have to do anything I tell you. <laughs> Rumour has the stadium's foundations before all the Shia Iraqis leave the country. Those are the bad Iraqis, according to the Saudis, by the way. <laughs> Next, they won't install stadium lights unless Baghdad sends troops to Yemen to help the tired Saudi army out. And the stadium AstroTurf won't be installed until the Iraqi government cuts diplomatic ties with Tehran. <laughs> Al Qazemi, do you want the Americans to build a ceiling for the stadium? Yeah? So turn over the political activist who has taken asylum in your country. Yalla ya habibi! Which roughly translated means yabba dabba do! <laughs> to be honest, it's easy to imagine the Saudi royal doing sport. But they have registered their sword dancing on the UNESCO list as their traditional art, together with the other traditional pastime of abducting prime ministers. <laughs> and if you like sword dancing with Saudis, remember to dance to their beat. One slip in the rhythm could cause them to lose their heads. And then you can lose yours. <laughs> Only joking, but not really. 
Uh, time to see what our time machine has in store for us this week. Stay tuned. One thousand years ago, the Saudi Crown Prince commissioned the kingdom's scientists to make the best coronavirus vaccine in the world. Those who were suspicious of the low number of COVID-19 victims in the kingdom carried out independent investigations. They went to places where the COVID-19 patients were being kept. To their astonishment, they came across the princes. Soon after the Saudi Crown Prince imposed the nationwide lockdown, all the women rights activists, independent journalists and critics disappeared. Meanwhile, some American companies needed a number of volunteers for the initial test of their COVID-19 vaccines. Historians all agree that Saudi Arabia was the first country to send the volunteers just for the The Saudi scientists didn't succeed in making the best or even the worst coronavirus vaccine. Instead, they managed to manufacture a much more sophisticated machine. They made state-of-the-art surveillance drones to pinpoint those who did not love the royal family very much. Soon, the kingdom's street became empty of people. Experts found out that those infected with COVID-19 were executed and buried at once and the virus had no chance to spread. Now, as usual here on Cats and Dogs, we have a very special person on the phone. When he's not speaking out against Iran, Iraq, Syria and Palestine, he gets back to his main job, trying to buy an English football club. Yes, please welcome the man who wants to get his hands on the keys to Newcastle United, Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. <laughs> Mr. Crown Prince, great to have you on the show. Yes, it is. All right, okay. Tell us about your plan for the Premier League team, Newcastle United. Our plan is to take the, from the Premier League up to Division 1 or even Division 2. <laughs> Hold on, going from the Premier League to League 1 or 2 is a demotion. Is it? But two sounds better than one and certainly better than Premier. No, that would be a demotion. Oh, I admit we know less about soccer than we do about the sauce. So, as usual, we have bought good advice from a friend. So, who have you paid? An unemployed man, actually. Oh, a local Saudi who's lost his job to an American. Uh, no, an American who's lost his job to an American. Oh, you mean Trump. Yes, uh, poor man. But that's what you get with democracy. It could never happen here. So what's he got to do with Newcastle United? Uh, Donald uh, proposed a three-day comprehensive solution and three proposals. Go on. President Trump proposed we train our players. <laughs> Second, he said we should... 
and third, which is apparently very important, he said they should win things. Win things? Win what? He didn't say. Uh, let's be honest. He's not very good at winning mm. things himself. How much did this advice cost? In fact, we didn't pay him. The thing is, he paid us. You're kidding. No, I'm serious. We just promised to keep the price of oil below $30 so he could buy it. <laughs> oh, and uh, we spend uh, a bit on buying American weapons. Uh, just the usual, you know. So, Mr. Ben Salman, you now hope to propel Newcastle United... From the Premier League into the first and second divisions and beyond. Using petrodollars. Uh, no, no, no. It is not Petro dollars. I, like all Saudi citizens, will receive a salary for my responsibility and position. One person uses a salary to buy a dishtasha. I use my spare cash to buy a Premier League football club. Should anyone restrict the right to do that? No, it's my human right. Mr. Crown Prince, thanks very much. Hold on for a moment. Uh, we're out of time. I'll give you two million dollars if you give me a minute to tell you about the human rights in football. Two million dollars, you say? I'm listening. Hey, who, who cut him off? Call me later. And that's all we've got time for on the show. Me next time to find out who's guilty of foul play, who's offside, and who's been sent off. I'm Lemba Topic, this is Press TV, and that was Cats and Dogs.